please? That's the first. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have a moment to be happy to be in person with all of you. This is very exciting. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah rosen -Wartel. I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute. And uh, it has been over two years since we've had an in-person audience in the space. You are all our first, so thank you for being here. Also, uh, thank you to those of you who are online joining us now or watching in the future. I have to do the technical housekeeping still because we're in both worlds. Um, this event is being recorded, and the recording and its links that we have to things that are mentioned, including the uh, notice, uh, will be online on the web page. Live captions are available. All virtual participants are muted. If you want to ask questions um, for our second panel, if you want to uh, either be in the room or virtually, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A box. Those of you who are here may have gotten access to the link that you used to register, and there's also some cards on your table with the QR codes. Um, and uh, if you are having any technical issues, and this is a new platform, um, accessing or viewing this, you can contact events at urban.org. That's being monitored, and we'll try to give you any technical assistance we can. Um, as I said, we are new to hybrid, though, and so we really would welcome your feedback. If you, uh, you're going to get on all a post-event survey, and we would be grateful if people would send that back and tell us both how the technology went and any thoughts about the program as well. And lastly, if you want to join the conversation online, turn off your email, but you can keep your Twitter open if you like, and use the hashtag, please, live at urban so others can see it. The Twitter handles for all of our participants in both panels are on the bio page on the website. So finally, a couple of thanks. First of all, thank you to our guests from the federal agencies. It is um, unusual to have uh, all three together in any forum that I can remember publicly, other than ones you convene yourselves. So we're very, very honored by that. Thanks to our guests on the other panels and the urban staff who uh, work together with agency staff to put this together on short notice. And I'm very grateful to all of them. And thank you, everyone, for being here. So a minute about our purpose today, um, and I suspect most of the people tuning in know this history, but I think it's important to provide the context. CRA passed in 1977 as part of a series of civil rights statutes. It was a direct response to redlining, and it's important always to put conversations today in their historical context. That was the policy of both lenders and their public agency regulators to discriminate and deny people of, act, of color access to credit and to the communities where greatest opportunities would be found. We very much see the consequences of those intentional choices made decades ago in today's large and widening home ownership and wealth gaps. The CRA rules issued in 1978 have been changed only twice, once significantly in 1995 and some more modest revisions in 2005. But the world today is so different than when those rules were written. More broadly, CRA is about banks meeting the needs of communities. But there, too, there has been great change. The needs of our communities, how we live and organize ourselves and what we do in our home towns, our understanding of community needs has changed. And our ability to measure and um, assess whether we're meeting those objectives or not has also changed. And the very community development ecosystem in which CRA positions the banks it amidst, that ecosystem has changed as well. Two and a half years ago, shortly before the pandemic began, the FDIC and the OCC, but notably not the Fed, issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking laying out a direction on CRA modernization. Shortly afterwards, we were very proud to host Governor Brainerd here at Urban to share her thoughts about CRA modernization, one of the last events we did in public, I think, also. And there she indicated that the Federal Reserve was pursuing a different path. The OCC alone went on to finalize a rule in June of 2020. And then in September 2020, this time remotely, we again hosted Governor Brainerd uh, to discuss the Fed's own proposed rule that they issued, or advanced notice of proposed rulemaking they issued uh, that morning. Today is a different story. 
Today, we have brought all three of the regulatory agencies, not we, they have brought themselves together to advance um, a unified approach to this policy area. A few weeks ago, the boards all approved a new uh, proposed rule, and once again, they are united in their approach to regulating CRE, even though the different institutions that they each regulate now are going to be, once again, if finalized, covered under the same rule. The proposal includes many changes from current practice, much innovation, and I think, happily for the Urban Institute, we're pleased to see it's really based on a kind of data-driven approach that's different than what we've seen before. But the next couple months, and it's not that long uh, before comments are due, is going to be a period, I hope, of intense scrutiny, analysis, comments, and efforts to help uh, give the best information possible to the regulators so that they can finalize a proposal. Here at the Urban Institute, over the last few years, we've been deploying our prowess to understanding the statute's strengths and weaknesses and to trying to inform this multi-year rulemaking process. Our focus has been, among other things, on whether the results of the new rules would address the origin story I mentioned at the beginning, which is to say the, le the country's legacy of sorry segregation and redlining that is still mapped in our geography and to consider whether these rules will have the effect of moving our country towards greater equity in business formation, wealth, and home ownership. Uh, just a note on the program, we're going to have this conversation with our agency leads, and then we'll have what we call a brief data interlude, where two of my colleagues, Brett Theodos and Lina Zhu, will come forward and share some very preliminary work that they've done looking at um, uh, possible impacts from the rules. We'll be doing much more of that over the comment period. Um, and then after that, we will hear from a great group of commentators and experts on CRA. So I encourage everyone to stay tuned through it all. But for now, let me turn to the proposal's authors and just once again say thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to do two kind of general opening comment questions for you, um, uh, and then we're going to dig into, we have a lot of topics to cover. Um, I want to just ask you to talk about the journey um, and how you chose and decided to come together and why that was important to you, and maybe Lael and then Mike and Marty. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, hosting us here. Um, and I think uh, the contrast between the last time I had an opportunity to engage uh, with an Urban Institute um, audience, uh, and this time is that you know I'm here with um, two committed agency heads, and all three agencies uh, worked really hard among our expert staffs uh, to arrive at a joint proposal among all three agencies with the support of all of the members of our three agencies. That in itself, I think, is a very good sign. And I'd say in terms of the journey, this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity. As uh, was noted, uh, the CRA hasn't had a substantive rewrite for a quarter century. And we believe that the proposal that we put out will strengthen the CRA, make it updated for today's banking system, today's communities, and the future of banking and the way communities develop uh, by strengthening credit, strengthening investments, and strengthening banking services in those communities that have traditionally faced the greatest challenges. So we're really pleased uh, that we came to this uh, with a joint uh, rule, and we're excited about uh, the content of that rule. Yeah, just to build off of what uh, Lael said, you know, there, there is this saying, um, faster alone, farther together. And I think that that's reflected here, where um, at the OCC, you know, as, as you had mentioned at the intro, uh, we had gone alone. And then once uh, I came into office, through a series of like, feedback, uh, reflection, analysis, saying, OK, what is the right path forward? I think clearly what we heard from all stakeholders was stay together, strengthen and modernize. And there are some elements of learning uh, that, we, that were incorporated. So I think some of the um, more quantitative based approaches, the details are different, obviously. But I think the ideas, some of those concepts or, or carry forward. Um, uh, in addition, like on the community development side, this kind of concepts around greater certainty, 
around some of the qualifying activities and around the process. Again, some of those elements were incorporated. And then one, uh, especially in terms of the uh, focus on native land areas and just recognizing there's some unique challenges there that uh, do warrant kind of special calling out and integration. So there's some things where I think over time where, you know, just through feedback and learning, I think that's going to be con continued to be part of the process. Um, and of course, this is a, a notice for proposed rulemaking. So there's a lot of opportunities for comment uh, to continue to improve. Uh, the, so Marty, I'm going to ask you the second question too, and you'll do, if you wouldn't mind, do both. So both this about the journey and then for each of you, I know it's hard. You all have lots of babies embedded in the <laughs> 700 pages. Um, but is there one thing about either an element of the rule or the approach of the rule that you think will be the most significant, important change? I think there is. Let me just, on the first point, and I obviously yeah. agree with everything that Leila and Mike mentioned. I, um, I think there was a um, common objective among yeah. the three agencies in this work. And I really, you referenced the ANPR that the Fed had done, and I, um, I think uh, I really uh, give the Fed a lot of credit, and I think that ANPR itself was very thoughtfully done and really provided us a blueprint to work off of. So, you know, this proposed rulemaking is comprehensive and it's complicated, and, but the, the fact that we had the ANPR as a blueprint to work off of really facilitated the process and allowed us, I think, one, to get to where we are, which is in both an ambitious proposal but really thoughtfully and carefully developed that I think will really stand up. So I wanted to mention that. And then um, there's a lot in this proposal. The thing that uh, to me is the biggest ticket item and uh, uh, was the big challenge was you know, how do we adapt CRA to the changing nature of the banking business? And CRA had always been tied to the branch network, the facility-based assessment areas. And just to be clear, the branches remain critically important, and the branch-based assessment areas are still where the large majority of the lending by banks takes place. At the same time, we also know that an increasing part of banks' lending activity is done outside of the traditional branch-based assessment areas. So the key thing uh, was really developing um, an approach that would allow us to capture for CRA evaluation a significant lending done outside of the assessment areas. And the, to me, there's a lot but the new retail lending assessment areas, which are assessment areas where the banks do significant lending activity, mortgage and small business, and we have metrics to measure it. And if um, the lending meets the metrics, even if they do not have a, a physical presence, that will become a new retail lending-based assessment area subject to the CRA lending evaluation. And that will really allow us to capture a substantial portion of lending that was not really subject to CRA. And the charm of that, it, it's adaptable to all the different business models. So if you have a large bank with a big branch network, they're still doing more lending outside of the branches, it captures that. But even the banks with more idiosyncratic business models, whether they have one, only one branch or no branch at all, it's adaptable to those business models. So it really, with this one approach, it really changes the center of gravity for CRA going forward. And really, I think, is one of the key things, perhaps the key thing that really strengthens the rule and expands People the People have reach. been talking about how to figure this out for 20 years of my professional life. Lael, your one big thing? Well, I certainly agree with Marty that um, you know, as banks had changed their business models, less and less of their activity was being evaluated. And we are scoping in a lot more activity um, that will be evaluated. Um, and that means that low and moderate income communities will be served better and more. We're also very focused on areas that might be very underserved. And so we have nationwide assessment areas and banks will get credit for doing things in those areas. And we know there are areas of the country that do not have branches 
partly in native lands, but there are other credit <coughs> deserts where uh, there'll be tremendous uh, benefits to banks. And of course, investments in MDIs and CDFIs, we saw with the PPP program who was there getting to the last mile, getting to those underserved small businesses and households. Um, it really was the CDFIs and the MDIs that had those relationships. Those are uh, communities of color as well, often women-owned businesses. So uh, giving uh, very strong uh, incentives for partnering, investing in those institutions, I think will also scope in a lot more activity. Mike, your so, pick? So uh, it's, it's going to sound like a cop-out answer, but it's not. You had <laughs> noted that the, you know, the needs of communities, they've been changing. They're varied. And I think one of the things, I, I strongly agree with uh, what Marty had said, that this is a complicated rule, in part because the needs are complicated. And so you, we, it rises to the challenge of doing that. And I think overall, as a package, what do we want? We want and we need just more activity, more CRA activity, like the quantum needs to go up. It's got to be better in the sense that different communities have different needs at different times. So how do we address those? Because um, uh, there's different facets to that. And you need it to be faster and more clear. And so how do you achieve that? And you can't do that easily through you know, one provision here or one provision there. They all have to fit together. And they really have to give a, a huge amount of credit to the staff across all three agencies who really, through, I mean, they, just working around the clock and debating a lot of these things to say, OK, what's the right framework for setting that up so we can achieve all three of those things simultaneously, dealing with a lot of uh, thorny, uh, difficult issues. And I think it landed in a, in a pretty good place. And I see, so there's 180 questions <laughs> throughout the document, and we really need that feedback to help inform the calibration on a lot of this. And I think that that's what we're hoping for. So back to you, Mike, because you mentioned earlier community development yep. provisions of the rule. Um, in many ways, the Banks deliver to communities directly, mm -hmm. and sizably they deliver to the communities through partnerships right. of lots of different kinds, their investments, right. their, their relationships. Um, this proposal has obviously a lot of attention to that ecosystem right. of relationships. So I want to ask any of you who, who want to identify, but I'll start with you. So what do you imagine if this works? What is the world, the ecosystem of community development going to look like? Do you have a thought in your mind about how we may be evolving through this more robust set of uh, relationships that we might build? So if it works, all the needs will be met. And I think we want to root it back to the origin story, as you put it. Uh, there would be no redlining. There would be no discrimination. All of the communities, especially for low and moderate income households and communities, would be met. Now, how are they going to get met? And I think that's... It, no one set of institutions can do it uh, by themselves. And there's a bunch of different areas. So I'd like to just highlight three. Okay. So one is what Lael mentioned with CDFIs. So community development financial institutions are mission focused. Right? They're, they're designed to focus on underserved populations, low and moderate income uh, communities. And under the existing rule, banks do get CRA community development credit for partnering. But there are you know, the documentation requirements. It, it's messy. It takes some time. And in the proposal, that's cleaned up. There's a presumption that Treasury certified uh, CDFIs, uh, those, will those, those investments, services, et cetera, will qualify. So that's just an incentive. And furthermore, under the, the impact review of CD uh, activities, that's positively viewed, those CDFI uh, activities. So there's incentives built in because those institutions know those communities really well. Um, and through those partnerships, we can uh, achieve more of kind of meeting those needs. So on the CDFI front. Second, we talk about native uh, land areas. So there, again, just calling that out because there's some really unique challenges there and kind of ensuring that there's incentives there for that. And the third relates to um, kind of disaster uh, prevention and climate resilience and making sure that you know, a lot of LMI communities are particularly vulnerable to extreme weather, um, uh, 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 drought, precipitation, et cetera. And so ensuring that there's a mechanism that that's, that's called out and there's a mechanism to encourage that because, again, those are the needs, right? We have to ground it back. What are the needs of the communities in making sure that the ecosystem that you described identifies the right needs and we have the, the right delivery channels and partnerships and incentives to meet those needs? 
So I hope we're going to be able to have time to come back and talk a little bit more about uh, climate. Do you guys have anything else you want to add, or do you want to move on to small business? Well, uh, let me just say uh, we're going to measure community <laughs> development, yep. finance, <clears throat> investments in a comparable, consistent way and benchmark it against the footprint of the bank for the first time. So we're no longer going to be guessing what the adequate level of community investment is for a satisfactory. We're going to have metrics, uh, and we're going to be able to compare metrics. We're going to see communities that just aren't getting anywhere close to the kind of community investments relative to bank presence as some others, and that's going to lead to some additional investments. I think that's a huge change. Fundamentally, what this rule is going to do is broaden the reach to capture more lending activity than is being captured now for CRA evaluation and raise the bar for performance, meaning uh, what a bank did before to earn an outstanding or high satisfactory rating will not be sufficient. They're going to have to engage in more lending activity to earn the recognition. So the from a broad perspective, we're going to broaden the reach and raise the bar with the goal of more lending to more low and moderate income communities. I think fundamentally that's what this is. is um, so I think my question is do. really about one dimension of raising the bar, which is in small business. There seems to be a lot more um, uh, analytics going into this discussion of which small business we're lending about. You're encouraging, I think, if I understand this right, them to really focus on the small end of small business. Um, do any of you want to just sort of describe a little of that mechanism and what the thinking was? I don't. So on uh, small business, uh, you're exactly right. Um, there is, um, first of all, we want to use data. Um, and we want to make the data the same data that banks are reporting for other purposes. So we want to take advantage of the 1071 data collections um, and use that less burden on banks, but lots of value in terms of consistent measurement. And secondly, we try to distinguish between small businesses and very small businesses, so below 250,000. Why? Because again, you know, we learned a lot in the pandemic, it is some of those smallest mom and pop shops out in communities that are providing vital services and have the hardest time getting access to credit. So we want to lift up the value. We know it's hard for banks. Um, it's, it's more due diligence and you know it is putting more time and effort, but that's the thing that's going to revitalize those communities. Those smallest of small businesses are more often likely to be minority owned, uh, women owned, and so it achieves a lot of really valuable purposes by making that emphasis on the smallest of small businesses. So also, I think, Lael, if you would start on this. Um, as I mentioned, CRA was part of a suite of statutes that were passed at the time that were designed to counter racial discrimination. Um, but the statute itself focuses on the income of the residents of the community and the incomes of the borrowers of the loans, which our research at Urban shows, and I know yours has as well, overlaps, but not, is not always synonymous with non-white communities and households. Um, in the proposal, the LMI framing remains, um, and I suspect you'll hear a little bit about that in the comment period from people about whether this moment is one to bring multi-dimensions to it or not. Um, but there are uh, a bunch of interesting changes, and from my perspective, the question I really want to ask is about what do we think the effect will be? Um, one way to look at it, is it going to be helpful to close the equity gaps that we're still seeing in many communities? And I know you've done a lot of analysis um, uh, before this uh, comes out. So can you talk a little bit about how you think it might be helpful to addressing systemic uh, structural barriers? Well, I can start and then uh, hopefully Marty and, and Michael chime in because we all spent a huge amount of time. This is a very important, very important issue to all of us. Um, I think you did a nice job in introducing this to describe both the spirit of the law because it was part of a set of civil rights laws 
uh, with clear roots and redlining, and the letter of the law, which is very specifically focused on low and moderate income communities as the group um, that uh, banks need to be attentive to serving. So we asked questions, we got great answers, and we think we strike that balance really nicely. There are some provisions in there that we believe will have the effect of serving communities that have faced systemic inequities. So if you go through them, retail lending, we distinguish between low and moderate income borrowers. That's very important. Um, those are very different groups. Um, we distinguish between the smallest of businesses and small businesses. Again, we think that will help at getting at some of those systemic inequities. We talk about um, providing credit for special purpose credit programs. That's another area that could have um, the effect. We uh, have special disclosure requirements on home mortgages using existing HMDA data, but asking uh, banks to be specific about the racial and ethnic distribution of their lending uh, in their assessment areas as well. And of course, we double down on that very strong connection between fair lending uh, and um, the CRA in terms of the designation and delineation of assessment areas and also the potential downgrade on a CRA exam from fair lending. So that's the list. I, Marty can perhaps add. Yeah, no, I, look, I think I'll hit on most of them. I, I do think uh, three things I'd point to. Uh, the disclosure provision that Lael mentioned, I think, is, is quite meaningful. And it, it's utilizing publicly available data. And it's simply going to enable us to get a profile of an institution's lending activity to communities of color on an assessment area basis. And what that will allow us to do is to look at an institution's lending activity in communities of color as compared to other communities, and also will allow us to compare the institution's lending in communities of color to lending by other institutions. So it gives us a line of sight that I think will be meaningful in our understanding, in the institution's understanding, and in the public's understanding of how these institutions are serving these communities. So I think that's quite important. And then also, right now, um, uh, fair lending violations are a basis for a CRA downgrade. This proposed rule would expand that to include uh, deposit products as well as credit products. So we're broadening the scope of a CRA downgrade if a bank should engage in some discriminatory activity. And then third, in terms of drawing assessment areas, uh, any assessment area has to include the entire MSA. It cannot be just a portion, or the, I should say the entire county, rather than a portion of a county, which is intended, frankly, to allow, to, to prevent uh, redlining. So, you know, um, uh, I think these are meaningful things that, the, that this rule does to, to try to address what really was the origin issue for CRA. The only thing I would add is that you had asked about the effect. And I think the, 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 the hope is that the cumulative effect of everything that Leila and Marty described leads to, because in the racial wealth gap, the, the, two, the two major things, home ownership gap and with small businesses, and you combine that with the transparency, I think the idea is that if this all kind of plays through the way it's designed, that gap should be addressed through some of this. And I think that that's really, we want to look at the outcomes are the, are the most important. Great. So um, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that here at the Urban Institute, public access to data is a key uh, focus for us and I think was a theme in a lot of this work, both information being provided to the institutions themselves, but also much more information from the institutions to the public as well. Um, and I'd love to hear you think talk a little bit about why you think that information will be helpful, particularly to the communities. And I'm going to ask a twofer question in the interest of time. Also wanted to, there is going to be a tension maybe uh, between the level of burden. We always hear about the burden uh, on institutions in these uh, reports and planning. And this is an added complexity, no doubt. Um, and uh, um, at the same time, that burden helps to 
create the information that can be empowering. So how did you think about those trade-offs? Um, well, I can, I can start. Um, so we just, uh, I think, uh, all the way through um, have been very focused on uh, what can we uh, use data to inform in terms of setting thresholds. So uh, we compiled a database for the first time, and that really helped inform the entire structure of the proposed rule. I think that's really important. Um, and we also, um, in order to uh, provide greater consistency across our agencies, uh, but also greater predictability for banks. Banks want to know, if I make this investment, how much credit will I get? Banks are data-driven. They want those dashboards. And so we really see there as being um, a kind of mutual benefit to the communities and to the banks. Banks get more predictability about what their expectations. But communities also get a better ability to benchmark and say, hey, wait a second. We're not getting the kinds of investments. We're not getting the kind of... Uh, level of home loans or um, small business loans that uh, is uh, the national average or the regional average. So we think there's a real benefit here. Um, and of course, uh, we, we think that by measuring, uh, we'll actually see um, more investment, more credit, um, and uh, much greater reach because of the reasons that Marty said earlier, we're going to be measuring in a much larger number of areas. Marty, you deal with a lot of the smaller institutions, community-based institutions? The, the, well, I think uh, we were very uh, sensitive to um, uh, uh, implementing this rule in a way that would acknowledge differences in size, complexity, and business model. So I think we were particularly attentive to the impact on small institutions and differentiated from the larger institutions. So on the data side, small institutions largely will not have increased data responsibilities. For the larger institutions, and you asked up front, you know, what was the, what's the most important change here? And I, you, you could reasonably argue that um, uh, having a data-driven approach to uh, CRA evaluation is as fundamental and transformative a change uh, as anything else in this rulemaking. And it, I think it'll give, um, it'll strengthen the rule and we'll have the benefit uh, for both the um, industry and for community groups as in regard to greater transparency, greater predictability and certainty in terms of implementation. And I think that will enhance the um, operation of the rule across the board. So it's a, it's a big ticket item. Um, so Marty, can I come back to you and talk about the services test for a minute? Um, uh, your institution thinks a lot about financial inclusivity, trying to draw people into the system. Uh, I know that um, there's a lot of thought went into how this proposal could try to help increase access and usage of basic bank accounts and other types of services. So do you want to just explain a little bit the services test and talk about the thinking there? Sure. And very briefly, two key things. One, um, the, the uh, proposed rule will give explicit credit to low-cost or no-cost deposit accounts, which we think is a threshold hurdle in terms of access to the banking system for people who are currently unbanked. And, you know, the FDIC sponsors a biannual survey of the unbanked and underbanked. <clears throat> and you ask folks, you know, why don't you have a bank account? And the two most common responses, and they're consistent, First response is, well, we don't think we have enough money to warrant an account. Second response is, well, the, the fees associated with the account. And if you have high fees, it ties directly into feeling like you don't have enough money. And by encouraging banks, and this is, I think, fairly, fair to say broadly supported by the banking industry, in offering um, low-cost or no-cost basic banking accounts with... Um, 
uh, no or very low minimum balances, and, and low or no fees, particularly no overdraft fees. It really lowers the hurdle and expands the accessibility of the banking system to people who are currently outside. And the other thing I guess uh, worth mentioning is branch location. We give credit to banks will, that will maintain their branches, and we will give credit to banks that will locate branches in LMI communities. And, you know, important not to the branch network, particularly for people on the low end of the scale, for minorities, for the elderly, the branch networks still are critical important, critically important to access. So I think worth keeping both, both of those things in mind. Mike, you mentioned earlier climate and um, neighborhood resilience. Um, a lot of the work we do here around this, um, the climate impacts in low-income communities suggest not only, as you mentioned, are many of the worst impacts on low-income areas, but the planning and resiliency work that you see happening in downtown Miami is not happening in Homestead in the same way because the communities aren't resourced for it. Um, do you think that that, in specific and more generally, how do you see this rule um, being helpful? This is an area, generally the rule's been well received, this is an area where there have been some eyebrows raised about it coming into the CRA analysis. I'd like right. to hear your thinking. Right, so I'll start off again. We're grounding it in the needs of the community, right? So we want to make sure we're meeting the credit needs of the community, and part of those credit needs is driven by this vulnerability and disproportionate impact that, that you had mentioned before, which I think is fairly well uh, documented and understood. Two things to highlight. One is, you know, under the uh, existing rule, there is credit given to disaster recovery. There's kind of been a focus on recovery. And here, it's a more explicit focus and shift to preparedness. And so uh, when people say, well, what does that mean? You know, a couple examples. For instance, um, in some uh, flood-prone zones, some of those are really, like, LMI communities are. So uh, efforts to to, uh, produce uh, flood control, that would be, that would quote unquote qualify, you know, of course, with all the, uh, the caveats. Some things like that would qualify. Uh, a lot of affordable housing is older stock that's more prone to damage uh, from extreme weather. So, um, kind of uh, uh, improving, uh, revitalizing those particular projects. Things like community centers and green spaces for extreme hot and extreme, so like cooling centers, warming centers. We're seeing more of that. And again, those disproportionately impact low and moderate income com communities. And so a lot of this is just recognizing those needs and risks and creating some space where there's explicit uh, avenues for CRA uh, uh, activities to be relevant to that. Um, one of my colleagues has done some work that suggests that um, you see terrible credit impacts on um, neighborhoods after there's been a yeah. major disaster effect, but that those credit effects um, uh, rebound for upper middle class families right. and persist and permanently damage the financial well-being. So there are ties between the financial system and the, uh, the climate impacts. Um, so let's talk just briefly before we kind of give you a chance to reflect and wrap up about place. Um, You've each touched on it in some ways, um, but I just wanted to have a moment to reflect on geography and how much place matters for opportunity in this digital age. Um, you know, in some ways, we're, we know more about place's importance, and yet we also think that we all are having this conversation together in many parts of uh, the country. So how, Marty, you started to touch on this, the, the difference between the importance of branches and the new modes of banking and their broader, imagine. How have you been thinking about it? And then if anyone wants to elaborate on the, the rural and especially underserved communities, including uh, tribal lands, um, and I'll invite any of you to start. Well, I think um, we thought a lot about this issue um, because banks are increasingly serving consumers and consumers want that convenience, uh, mobile and online, but we know that those relationships in communities are what leads to loans to uh, the smallest of small businesses, investments in um, those communities. And so we were trying um, to thread that needle. So how do we do that? Now, obviously, uh, partly by giving credit. And so we're very um, clear in a variety of different uh, ways that banks should get credit for serving hard-to-serve communities uh, including 
uh, native uh, land areas that traditionally haven't been reached by branches, areas where there may not be branches, um, but you can get credit for investing in a CDFI or making community investments. Um, we uh, have a nationwide assessment area for um, community development um, for uh, those areas uh, that uh, are persistent poverty areas. There's special credit uh, given uh, for those areas. Um, and in addition to the metrics, which we think are um, going to add rigor and uh, raise the bar, we also have community engagement and impact factors which are intended to be qualitative in nature and to involve the community in judging the responsiveness to the local community um, and the impact, not just the dollar amount of financing, but the actual impact. So there are a host of different ways that we're trying to double down on that original focus, which we think is so important, of serving your community, which is a place-based community. And we're very attentive to rural areas. We have different expectations for volunteer activities in rural areas, for instance, um, than we do uh, in urban areas. And uh, that is part of the push uh, to get uh, investment into uh, credit deserts. So I would just invite each of you to share a final thought or a final word, and maybe, if you'd like, uh, address the question, what do you want from the rest of the community? What are you hoping that you're going to still learn through this rulemaking process? Obviously, you're very proud of this work. Uh, that's shown. And yet, I suspect we probably have some further refinements to make. So any, Marty, why don't you start? Well, um, we put a tremendous amount of effort I'm using the royal way. I would start with the staffs, <laughs> but we put in some time, too. <laughs> and I do think the quality of the product as I mentioned, was, is, is, is thoughtful and, and carefully done. That being said, uh, nothing is perfect, and it's a large, complicated rule. So I, I think we all view the um, comment period, and we provided a 90-day comment period in recognition of the ambitiousness of the proposal. Um, that we, we assume there's a, a lot there we uh, either didn't get right or may have missed or could be improved. And so the, the opportunity for an extended, you know, extended comment period and to get feedback from all, as it were, the stakeholders of CRA, I think is really going to be essential to the process. And I hope, you know, will put us in a position to get to a final rule that will, um, if anything, be even more thoughtful and more impactful than the proposed rule. So, you know, it's a it's a terrific opportunity that we have here. I think we've laid a solid foundation with the proposal, and I think the comment period, from my standpoint, will give us an opportunity to make the rule even better. Well, so, I, you know, I would just say um, that when uh, I travel around with our community affairs folks um, to uh, communities around the country, uh, it's just palpable uh, that CRA is just part of the oxygen of the ecosystem that supports uh, community development, you know, whether uh, the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, when you look at this uh, sort of, you know, uh, board of contributors to their housing and small business development project and you don't see a branch or a bank on there, you realize, oh, well, there are no branches here. And, you know, if there were a branch, you can be sure that that bank would be very invested in that. Uh, same is true in, you know, Hope or Itabena in Mississippi Delta. You know, the, the, the best uh, financial institution they have is a CDFI invested by, you know, a bank that did get credit for it. Um, and uh, certainly true when I'm in North St. Louis, all of the little small business and community development, they have proud community development bank partners. So CRA is just an incredibly important um, support that banks are proud of, that communities rely on. And I think this proposed rulemaking will strengthen it uh, and make it relevant uh, for the next uh, for the next 25 years, hopefully. Maybe to build off of Leo's point, when I travel around, I try to make it always a point um, to meet with the community organizations. And they always bring up CRA, absolutely, uh, how important it is and how much hope. I mean, this really does, I think, provide uh, a lot of hope at, in terms of 
continuing building, uh, improving upon that. Um, and then to echo a point that Marty made, um, the com I know there's, there's, there's some common fatigue out there on CRA, given all the various iterations there have been, but this is the one that really, really matters, and just really encouraging folks to please provide those comments, because um, we're going to take all of that into account as we improve it and kind of get to the final. Well, let me just say, first of all, thank you for the work that you and your teams have done. Um, it shows there's a lot of for all of us to digest outside. I hope we will be adding to the conversation uh, between now and the end of the comment period. And thank you for being with us. Um, please join me in. And if you'll sit tight, we're going to bring, we're going to exit and we'll bring on uh, Brett Theodos and Lena Zhu. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Is that okay? Welcome to the Urban Institute. It's so good to see you all in person, finally, after two years. It's my great pleasure to be here today, and I think it's a great timing for us to get together at the beginning of the National Homeownership Month. In an effort to modernize the current CRA regulations, one of the proposed changes uh, in the NPR is to evaluate low-income and moderate-income mortgage lending separately, both at the census tract level and at the borrower level. Together with my colleague, Laurie, Laurie Goodman and Ellen Setman, we hope to provide evidence, data evidence, to shed light on if this proposed separation of low from moderate income would provide greater incentives to better meet the, need, the credit needs of LMI communities and in individuals, as well as the needs of communities and individuals of color. First, let me give you a quick overview of the current single family mortgage lending. At neighborhood level, at neighborhood level, low-income uh, low income neighborhoods receive only 2.2% of total mortgage lending, a very small amount as compared to the 16.5% of the entire LMI communities. In addition, 18.2% of loans in low-income low neighborhoods are non-owner occupied, a very uh, high share as compared to the 8.5% nationwide. Similarly, at the borrower level, we find that low-income borrowers only receive 8% of total mortgage lending as uh, again still very low level as compared to the 27.7 percent of all LMI homeowners. This all suggests that both low-income neighborhoods and low-income borrowers receive a small amount of total mortgage lending. Now we see that in this table we only have one proxy which is income. Now let's add another dimension which is race to see how current mortgage lending looks like, looks like by income and by race. So at neighborhood level, we find that mortgage loans are particularly scarce in low-income, predominantly minority neighborhoods. Here we define a predominantly minority neighborhood as a census tract in which the non-white share of households greater than 70%, a mixed neighborhood with non-white share between 30 and 70%, and a predominantly white neighborhood with non-white share less than or equal to 30%. Spe specifically, here we can see that out of all single-family mortgage loans, only 1.1% are made to low-income, predominantly minority neighborhoods, even though these neighborhoods constitute 4.9% of the total census tracts. In contrast, predominantly white neighborhoods uh, make up 57% of the total census tract, but receive 66.3% uh, of loans. If you want to know what is the overlap between LMI neighborhoods and predominantly minority neighborhoods, this figure, this bar graph will give you the answer. So here, among all the loans made in low-income neighborhoods, around 61.5% were, uh, were made in predominantly minor, minority neighborhoods, a much higher share as compared to the 32.5% of moderate-income neighborhoods. So this large gap suggests that we're likely to see a greater overlap between 
between uh, low income neighborhoods and minority neighborhoods with the proposed separation of low from moderate income at the census tract level. Now moving to the borrower level, we find that low income borrowers receive a less than proportionate share of loans to LMI borrowers. Specifically, out of all mortgage loans, out of all single family mortgage loans, 2.5% uh, were made to low income minority borrowers, um, even though low income minority homeowners constitute 5.4% of total homeowners. More importantly, we see that 19% homeowners are low income, but only 8% of the current mortgage lending are made to low income uh, borrowers. This suggests a large gap, uh, lending gap in low-income mortgage lending. And again, here this bar graph gives you a sense of the overlap between LMI borrowers and minority borrowers. Different from the results we just saw at the neighborhood level, here you don't see a huge difference um, between low-income borrowers and moderate-income borrowers with respect to the minority share. And to note and to highlight that, around a third of the uh, loans made to minority borrowers are actually uh, to the uh, Third, a third, around a third of the loans made to low-income borrowers are actually for minority borrowers, suggesting that lending to low-income borrowers is not the same as lending to minority borrowers. Now we know that income, is, uh, income proxy do not highly overlap with the risk proxy. Our next question is, how is current lending serve LMI neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods, LMI borrowers, and minority borrowers? So at neighborhood level, we find that LMI and predominantly minority neighborhoods receive less than their proportionate share of mortgage uh, lending, especially bank mortgages. Uh, here, uh, for all the listed neighborhoods, LMI, low income, moderate income, and predominantly predominantly minority neighborhoods here in this figure. Uh, for each neighborhood, we're comparing three shares, share of homeowners, share of mortgage lending, and share of bank lending. For example, LMI neighborhoods um, con constitute 18.7% of all homeowners, but only receive 16.5% of the total mortgage lending and 14.4% of bank lending. Similarly, Predominantly minority neighborhoods constitute 10% of the total homeowners, but only receive 8.1% of mortgage lending and 5.9% of total lending. Um, Low-income neighborhoods is a tiny piece of this, but we can see that this pattern still holds. To note here, the share of homeowners should be treated as a lower bond estimate because it, bakes, it already bakes in the, histo uh, the systemic discrimination as well as historic redlining. Moving to the borrower level, we see that lending to low-income borrowers falls well short of their home ownership benchmark. Specifically, uh, if you look at the low-income borrower, the second box here, we see that uh, low-income home, uh, low home, homeowners constitute 19% of the total homeowners, but only receive 8% of the to uh, total mortgage lending and only 7% of bank lending. And moving to the last section, the minority borrowers, we see that uh, we see that the share of mortgage lending is slightly higher than the share of homeowners. This reflects the fact that um, for minorities, particularly for Hispanics and Asians, their population are schooled younger compared to the white population, and they're more likely to be at their prime home buying ages. But uh, even with this lower bound, bank lending still lacks. Uh, both lacks both the mortgage lending share as well as the share for homeowners. Now let's take, lastly, we take a deeper, deeper dive into the minority. We find if we break down the minority group by their race and ethnicity, um, um, we see that black borrowers are particularly underrepresented compared to current home ownership, especially in bank lending. So specifically, um, 30, uh, bank consists of 32.6% of all homeowners in low income neighborhoods, but only receives 17.9% of ho to total ho mortgage lending and 17.4% of bank mortgage lending. For Hispanic and Asian borrowers, as I just mentioned, because their population are schooled younger and they're reaching their uh, prime home buying ages, um, the current share of homeowners probably should be a lower bond estimate of the actual number of potential credit worthy borrowers. But even with this lower bond estimate, we see that for Hispanic borrowers, bank lending still lacks. Now to quickly conclude here with this with this proposed separation of low from moderate income at both census tract level and borrower level, um, this would enable 
This will enable regulators, bankers, as well as communities to more effectively focus on these particularly large gaps with respect to lending in low-income neighborhoods, lending in low-income, minor predominantly minority neighborhoods, as well as lending to black borrowers. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brett to talk about small business. Thank you all. Good morning and good to be with you. My charge is to lay out a little bit of context about what we know about small business ownership and finance in the US. And I would just like to start by saying we don't know enough. Um, we're not flying blind, that would be too strong a statement. Um, but we are, as they say, looking through a glass dimly. We simply can't answer some of the questions and metrics and data points that you just heard about homeowners on the small business side. So it really underscores the need for quick and robust action on 1071 and getting the insights that we need um, so that important regulations can be shaped. But I'll give you what we have. Okay, so first, who owns businesses in the US? How does that look uh, by race? And we'll also look a bit by place. Uh, so here's the share of US adults, 65% white, 16% Latina, 12% black, 6% Asian. Employer firms. And so here we see the racial composition of who owns a firm. Um, but we do see disparities uh, by race, uh, not just in firm ownership, right, but also in sizes of firms. So we can take it a step further and look at employees and the extent to which uh, what share of employees work in firms owned by people of different races. And we see still greater concentrations of white ownership in particular. And even further, if we look by sales, uh, so this is the underlying backdrop and context. Again, we're not going to be able to say uh, how small business uh, lending looks uh, to owners of these firms by race, um, but we can talk about it at this level. I also want to introduce us to thinking about it by place. And I think some of the challenge when we enter into the small business space is we think about it uh, as an extension of or, or in a way as residential. Uh, and so we bring a population frame to this. Um, but businesses are not equally distributed across cities. Uh, they're not equally distributed across neighborhoods. Uh, and so we have much greater concentrations of business activity in some place than in others. And so whereas census tracts are reason reasonably homogenous in terms of their population size, they're not at all in terms of their small business size. And so we really need to bring into our understanding of where capital is going and understanding of where businesses even exist. It is though, of course, chicken and egg, right? Because capital needs to go where small businesses already are, but in some ways where small businesses are, are is also shaped by where capital is willing to go. So here's just a figure that's showing share of the workforce that's self-employed in 50 of the largest metro areas. Uh, and I just show this to illustrate uh, some of the differences in concentration of small business activity across the US. But what if we then begin to scale that? So work that I and colleagues have been doing is looking at capital flows or investment flows into communities. And so if we kind of uh, take out of the equation the strength or the volume of activity of small businesses generally, do we still, still see disparities in lending? So what we have done is scale lending as best as can be measured, which is poorly, by the way, uh, through the CRA uh, lending data and through SBA lending data, and begin to look at per small business employee lending volumes. And so here that is for cities, uh, and I think some of these uh, or way these cities are ordered might surprise people, um, but uh, we're keeping in mind we're scaling by the existence of uh, how many small business active, uh, employees are in a space. And so one thing to draw out then is there are pretty significant disparities in how small business lending, as best as can be measured, is flowing across the country. And so then we're interested in understanding also where 
and why? What predicts, what associates with small business lending as we go? And one thing I want to begin with that is uh, different in this space is uh, city size uh, or um, rurality. So when we look at our other capital flows data, whether it's commercial real estate or multifamily or single family, size matters. Uh, and even on a per capita basis, a lot more investment is going into bigger places. There's denser networks of human capital, more appraisers, more accountants and lawyers, and everything comes together in a way. Um, but it's interesting in the small business space that that relationship is not really present. It's a lot weaker. And so when we scale and look on a small business uh, basis, um, actually city size uh, is not a meaningful predictor of capital flows. So that's one dimension that does not stand out in a small business way. Uh, so what does stand out? Well, there's a few things. Uh, and namely, there are the types that we have already been talking about related to income and related to race. So here's a map. I'll just show you a couple maps of small business lending in Chicago. Here is DC. There's Austin, Texas. San Francisco. And what do we take away from all of this when we begin to add it up to understand how investment is flowing into place? Again, we don't really know investment into people uh, from these data. So a meaningful indicator of where investment is going at a neighborhood level relates to economic standing or income. So here, for example, is a look at poverty of neighborhoods uh, and how much investment is flowing into the small business space. Uh, and again, this is scaled uh, per small business employee. So we're taking that out already from the equation. And then also by race. Uh, so we don't see a strong relationship between percent Asian and small business capital flows, again, scaled. Um, we do for black and also for Latina, where um, the higher the share of a neighborhood's population of uh, one or of those racial ethnic groups, uh, the lower we see uh, small business lending activity. And we see the reverse of a very linear and a steeply positive relationship of small business lending going into neighborhoods with higher white compositions. Um, so that's where I'll leave it. And just encouragement that as we're thinking about regulations, as we're thinking about rules, um, we really do need fundamentally to be able to measure not just investment into place, but investment into people. And some of the fair uh, lending tests that we have on home ownership, we actually need to know and understand in a small business ownership way. We need insights into actual owners. Because simply being uh, a business located in a certain neighborhood doesn't mean the owner has uh, or reflects the racial composition of that neighborhood. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. everybody. It's good to be here in person, as has been said, and it's really great to be here with this incredible panel. Um, without too much introduction and ado, we'd like to just keep the conversation going and try to break down some of the issues we heard about from the first panel, and uh, hopefully that ties to some of the data you just saw. So um, first, let me start with the good news. I want to hear from each of the panelists. Uh, what excites you the most? about this new proposal, other than, of course, the three regulators coming together and the fact that it's finally here <laughs> after nearly 30 years um, since the last um, revision. <clears throat> you want to start us off? Who wants to go first? Okay, I can kick it off. Okay. Uh, so I'm Marla Balanik with the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. Um, there were several things that I liked, and I'll end with my um, sort of favorite piece. But uh, first, I really like the expanded assessment areas beyond um, the originally conceived notion of assessment areas. Um, I like the expansion of the eligible community development activities from 4 to 11. Um, I'd like to liken it from going from prefix to buffet. I, I think it's a, it really gives a lot of opportunity to sort of play in that space. Um, I like the focus on the customer and reaching customers. 
Um, and I think it's a big win for rural and native communities. And lastly, I think it's just a huge affirmation that CDFIs, MDIs, WDIs, and low income credit unions um, know what we're doing. We're best positioned to respond to community needs. And I just think that the document reads as a, you know, sort of gold star for CDFIs. Great, great. Buzz, do you have any uh, favorites? <laughs> yes, I think the general approach to community development is a big, big improvement. Uh, there is now going to be a consolidated community development test. Under the current rule, community development activities been, have been fragmented among the three tests, the lending, investment, and service. And by combining them, I think you have a lot more flexibility to respond to what the actual community development needs are. Uh, it's going to be less a matter of form and more a matter of substance, and that's a big improvement. Second on community development, one of the big obstacles in the current rule is that it's just not clear what, whether activities will count or not in many cases. And especially the big banks, which may have hundreds of assessment areas with many, many metrics in each one, they've got to focus on things they know are going to count. And if they can't tell, they're going to move on to the stuff that is uh, well inside the lines. So uh, this is going to be a, a major, major uh, improvement. Mm -hmm. And finally, geography. Mm -hmm. uh, under the current rule, uh, banks get credit pr almost entirely for the work they do inside their assessment areas. And that just leaves uh, a lot of uh, imbalance uh, between CRA hotspots and CRA deserts. Uh, and in addition to that, the practice of community development uh, combines both local and regional and national approaches. And trying to manage regional or national approaches when you are trying to get make sure that each activity fits a bank's local branch footprint is uh, incredibly difficult and inefficient. So you bring all these improvements together and the potential is there to really turbocharge uh, what has already been, I think, a signature achievement of, of CRA, which is community development. So there are a couple of um, positive takeaways that uh, I had. The first is um, that the, there seems to be a more adaptive approach to today's banking uh, industry. I mean, when you think about non-branch models, uh, mobile bank models, internet bank models, uh, this rule seems to be much more adaptive to those frameworks. Um, the CRA assessment areas are updated so that examiners are hopefully looking at a more real world reflection of where lending institutions should be serving consumers. And then the second thing um, is something that uh, Governor Brainerd talked about, and that's the heightened emphasis and uh, alignment between fair lending. I examination outcomes and fair lending activity to the CRA ratings themselves. I mean, uh, this is something that civil rights groups have been opining about for a number of decades, Yannicka, as you know. I mean, uh, we look at situations where on the one hand, a bank will get a, deemed for a fair lending violation, and then on the other hand, that same bank will get an outstanding CRA rating and that just leaves uh, people uh, puzzling how that outcome could, uh, could happen when the CRA rule and law clearly states that a bank must serve its entire delineated communities. And so when you have that kind of, um, when you have that kind of misalignment, it makes people think that, oh, well, communities of color don't count when you're looking at the entire delineated uh, uh, assessment area. So let's stay with you and on that topic a bit. You know, the CRA has been around since 1977. It has been, as we heard from the last panel, income driven, yet was supposed to have a racial equity effect. 
we haven't seen a lot of moving, movement on things like the racial home ownership gap, the racial wealth gap. If anything, maybe it's even going in the wrong direction. Yeah. So in terms of what we heard from the last panel and what you've read, how has race been addressed? What do you think they've done well? Maybe what have they missed? Or, or if you have any thoughts about what could be improved, we'd love to hear that. Sure. Um, so I, I, I do think uh, that the rule could have been stronger on these issues. Uh, so we had some disappointments as we were pouring through it. Um, the rule still really emphasizes uh, low and moderate income issues. And I think we all have seen very clearly that focusing on low and moderate income issues is not going to advance racial equity. It's not going to close the racial uh, wealth gap or the racial home ownership gap. Quite frank, I mean, it's just a reality. There are more low income white people. There are more uh, moderate income white people in America. Uh, by a large margin, right? And so when you just look at the raw numbers, it's easy to see how an emphasis on income is not going to get you to racial equity. Look, year after year after year after year, when the Humda data comes out, what we see is that high income black consumers, high income low, uh, uh, Native American and other consumers of color don't get the same access to credit as low-income whites. So just sheerly focusing on income is not going to really advance the ball on racial equity issues. Um, we thought that this rulemaking would be an opportunity to really uh, mold the CRA tool into being a, an effective tool for advancing on racial equity. And so we Right now, if, if the rule stays the way that, that it is, we think it's a missed opportunity. Um, when it comes to the, the, the um, um, consideration of special purpose credit programs, I mean, uh, if any of you have been following the work of the National Fair Housing Alliance, you know we've been really promoting special purpose credit programs as a racial equity tool. but. In this proposed rule, you see that the, the consideration of special purpose credit programs is really through the lens of reaching and broadening access to low income and moderate income consumers. Well, you don't need ECOA for that. You don't need Reg B to expand access to uh, low income people. What you need Reg B and ECOA and the special purpose credit programs for is to specifically kind of hone in and focus um, your, your, your lending to African American, Black, Latino, Asian American, Native uh, consumers. And the rule doesn't, doesn't seem to um, focus on that. Um, and then I guess fi the final thing that I'll say, Yannicka, is that, Again, the CRA requires lend lenders to serve their entire delineated communities, including low and moderate income areas. Um, there's nothing in that that doesn't say that you can't include a focus on underserved communities of color, because underserved communities of color are a part of the entire community. And so we thought that the CRA could use, uh, we thought that the regulators could use that angle to be more declarative and to be more deliberate about um, trying to compel lenders to better serve communities of color. And, and we're just not seeing it in this proposed rule. Thank you, Lisa, for all that work. Do you guys want to add, chime in on that? Add I'll, I'll chime in briefly. Uh, so I think it is important to have that nexus between fair lending and CRA. But that's about avoiding the bad stuff and closing home ownership gaps and small business gaps by race is going to require intentionality. And so CRA could and should recognize and encourage proactive work uh, to bridge those gaps. That's what's missing. That's what fair lending evaluation misses. Uh, 
And so I really do think um, I am concerned, as Lisa suggested, that this is uh, uh, um, uh, an opportunity that could be missed unless uh, there were changes. And, and I would agree with my colleagues. I would just say that I think, you know, and I'll speak to this in, in a separate question, but I think we're sort of um, have a misaligned uh, moment here because we are coming into a phase where we will have more data about small business lending and the relevance of that data with regard to sort of receiving CRA credit will not be there. And so I, I just think that's kind of an odd um, alignment of, of sort of two tracks that, that didn't quite meet up. Um, and I, I'll also just say that, I, you know, to affirm Lisa's point, I, I don't believe that LMI designation is a de facto, uh, you know, sort of race uh, result. And so I, I was also very disappointed to see that race and ethnicity were not sort of explicitly called out. Um, maybe that, you know, can be influenced by the comment period, but we'll see. Thank you, Marla. Well, why don't we stick with you and, and okay. move on to small business, which often gets kind of <laughs> yeah. a little shorter shrift, perhaps because we have less data to begin yeah. with. And yeah. um, so, but it's an important part of the NPR, and there's a lot of stuff in there. So, I was wondering your thoughts about these changes. In which ways will they be effective? Um, and what improvements would will we be thinking about in the comment period? Yeah, I mean, the headline for me was the focused on focus on these very small businesses, uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollar revenue or below. Um, myself, having worked with small businesses my entire career, you know, since the late 90s, um, that spot is, is really where most community small businesses live mm -hmm. in low to moderate income communities. In this, you know, reaching in a million dollar revenue is a, a wonderful goal, but it's it's really just uh, not the the majority of of what is happening on the ground. And so, I thought that call out was very very important, and you know, very again to this point of the gold star to CDFIs, it's it's very affirmative that that the space in which CDFIs are working is is very much the right place and that CDFIs sort of know what they're doing and know how to address the needs of the community. You know, to touch on 1071 again, you know, 1071 is going to be pulling demographic data on um, small business owners, whether that's their gender, their race, their ethnicity. Um, the fact that this will not, this will neither sort of give credit or a ding to, to lenders is, is a shame. Uh, there are also some subtleties and nuances around sort of pricing to loans uh, that are given to people of color, um, terms that are given to loans uh, for people of color, and I, I just don't know that that will be captured. Um, I also think, you know, 1071 has been hanging out here for years, and, and it looks like 2023 will be the year, um, you know, but we, we certainly can't hold our breaths, and so the fact that it really sort of depends on that kicking in um, you know, I think I thought this could have been an opportunity to just say, you know, we know this is coming down the pike, so as part of this, we are going to require banks to start collecting this information. Uh, they're already collecting it, you know, for Humda data, so it, it really shouldn't be um, so challenging to do. And, and, you know, this is one of those things that when you're sitting around a dinner table, people don't know that small business lending is not held to the same thresholds, uh, you know, as, as uh, mortgage lending or, or consumer lending. And so, um, you know, I had hoped that there would have been more alignment there, but. It just really gets to how important the data and Absolutely. the sunshine is as Absolutely. part of CRA being effective. 100%. Totally. Thank you. Buzz, community <laughs> development, your favorite topic. Um, with respect to community development activities, um, as you mentioned already, there'll be a lot more, be a lot more clarity around what's going to get CRA credit. Um, there's a lot of details, um, hopefully not angels in the details. <laughs> um, but walk us through that. What particularly is going to work well there? And um, how do you think specifically that the impact factor analysis will affect community development activity? So I'm very excited about these impact factors because community development is about so much more than just dollar numbers. You could have a large transaction with very little impact and a relatively small transaction that has a great deal of impact, mm -hmm. a catalytic impact. And so the ability to take those qualitative factors into account is important, but it's also quite tricky because how do you quantify quali quality? Uh, so I think uh, the agencies have made a great start in laying that out. I think they've been judicious in acknowledging that they don't have all the data they need now, and by the way, neither does the public. 
about uh, community development activities under CRA. And so it's going to take them, I think, think some time uh, to uh, see what data gets generated, and that'll help them set the metrics in a, in a, on, a, on a stronger foundation. Uh, but this is uh, very encouraging. There are some things, I think, that could be improved in the impact factors, but there's nothing really that can't be addressed. Good, good, very good. If I can add yes, on, on to what um, Buzz just said, because this is a really important point. Uh, you know, as community organizations and people sort of working on the ground in communities um, think about how to put together programs and develop programs and initiatives that are going to revitalize their communities. As you guys know, you start from the bottom up, right? In community development, that's what we do. We reach out to the community stakeholders and we say, what do you need? What is going to change your life and turn your world around? And when they tell you what matters and what will be impactful for them, you put your your proposal together, you take it to the bank, and guess what? Everything is misaligned. <laughs> the bank tells you very quick, quickly, well, the metrics that the regulators are looking at and measuring us by, we don't think that they align directly with what you're bringing to us and what you're telling us is important as outcomes for the communities that you're serving. And also, we have to collect data in a certain way that matches and dovetails nicely with the way that we're going to be examined. So there, you know, Buzz, I think the point that you're making is critically important. And I guess what I'm struggling with is how are we going to, there are many lines of communication that have to be opened up so that we can reach alignment. Mm -hmm. How are we going to do that? And that's what I'm really struggling with. Oh, just agreeing. Okay, well, I think maybe we'll take a little uh, segue into audience questions now. If um, And we have gotten a lot of questions over the course of this morning. Uh, many of them were for the regulators, not for this panel. Um, and then we've had a lot of general questions. So I have um, somebody curating the ones. Thank you, Ellen um, Seidman there, for the, what, the that are appropriate for this panel. And we'll do a few of those so that we can have some sense of audience participation. So um, here's one. What, if any, plans are in place in the case that five ten, to ten years from now we have seen little change even after this new rule? That's Something a, to that's chew on and think about. Here we go, five to ten years from now. And maybe it would be good to sort of think about if we have a picture in our head of what we hope. We heard about hope from the last panel. If we have a picture in our head of what we hope for five to ten years from now, and then maybe what we do if we don't get there. Like, how will we know if, we're, if it's a success? What will it look like if it's a success, and then what will we do if we're not there? Yeah, and see, that goes back to the question about expectations and metrics and alignment, right? So if, you're, if you ask fair housing organizations and civil rights groups what looks like success, we're going to say things like, increased home ownership rates among communities of color. We're going to say better outcomes in the HMDA data. The HMDA data is showing that people of color have better and greater access. Uh, business owners of color have greater access to quality, sustainable credit. The wealth gap is shrinking. We're going to say things like that. But the question then becomes, are those the same metrics mm -hmm. that the regulators are uh, measuring lenders by? And that, I think we have to get some agreement around um, those kinds of questions and issues. So I think the intention is to encourage more community reinvestment, to encourage a race to the top. And a, a, it's, if I read this proposal accurately, there are some mathematic concerns. Uh, in order to get an outstanding rating, and that should be the goal for banks, they will have to have an outstanding performance on retail. Uh, 
if they don't have an outstanding performance on retail, it doesn't matter how much or how little they do on community development, they're not going to get an outstanding rating. And according to the analysis uh, in, the, in the preamble for this proposal, currently no lar very large banks are, would receive an outstanding rating on retail. So what we want to do is build ladders that banks can climb up in their performance and that we can get a race to the top. Uh, if we don't have a ladder, if instead we have a bar that is so high that it is beyond reach, then the message may be to banks, well, this is unachievable on retail, so I guess we should be aiming for a satisfactory rating, along with the other 80% or so of banks that are probably going to wind up with, with a satisfactory rating. We shouldn't really worry too much about community development because it's not going to really affect our rating. And therefore, we just don't want to be in the worst 10 or 15% of banks. That is how a race to the bottom could happen. I'm sure that's not the intention. I hope I'm interpreting this wrong. There's, this is easily fixable. Uh, so uh, I'm not at all without hope. But I think it's an important issue to address. I would just add one point to the comments that my colleagues have made, just that um, there isn't exactly a consideration around uh, equitable neighborhood development and uh, sort of anti-displacement efforts. And so that's something when, you know, to your question around what does success look like, you know, the last thing that we want to do as dedicated professionals in the community, community development field is drive gentrification uh, through community investment. And so, um, you know, something that we may include in the comment letter is, you know, emphasis on activities that uh, increase equity in communities. So whether that's ownership of homes, ownership of commercial spaces, uh, there's, you know, just a lot of opportunity around um, local residents owning the communities that they live in, and, and that's really the, the key to avoiding displacement, both for um, renters, homeowners, and small business owners. And so, you know, if there could be sort of some sort of special extra points for that, um, that might be a way to um, avoid that. Thanks for bringing that point up, and I, kind of, I want to put a pin on the gentrification mm -hmm. question and move on to that next, but before yeah. we do, I just, again, thinking about that five to ten year, what success looks like and what failure looks like, how we know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking almost like there needs to be an assessment of CRA broadly, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about the, the CDFI, MDI world? Do you, you know, do you see something specific there that you're hoping for? Um, could you clarify your question? What, so what do you mean? So do you have the new, how would the new proposed rule affect sort of the ecosystem? I think we talked about it in the last panel around the CDFI, MDI, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's a huge boon for the CDFI industry because if I understood the, the rule correctly, the any activity with the CDFI in partnership with CDFI or MDI is eligible. And therefore, um, it's less restrictive than, than previously. So I think it actually opens up a lot of opportunities. I think it, you know, will, right now, the CDFIs have never been more relevant, you know, in the light of the pandemic. And, and um, Lil even mentioned, you know, PPP sort of put a spotlight on CDFIs mm -hmm. and our capacity to serve communities, you know, as the, the sort of best positioned groups. And so, um, you know, to me, I feel like this is just a continuation of that moment that hopefully isn't a moment, but just now sort of the norm that, that CDFIs are looked at as, you know, experts uh, rather than, you know, uh, touchy-feely lenders. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. So back to gentrification, since there's this whole component of CRA that it's geographically based and we have seen in many of these communities an influx and a kind of a gentrification um, higher income workers moving into urban centers, um, and some have raised concerns that maybe CRA is encouraging this in some way. So do you share that concern? Marla already brought it up, so I'll, I think that's probably on the table. And what do you think the NPR has right or could do better around that? Anybody can answer that. Yeah, you know, that always has been an issue. Uh, um, it's, so it's not new, you know, in the context of this uh, particular uh, rulemaking, and and that is because um, banks, in, 
previously have gotten CRA credit for uh, developments that ended up not just gentrifying uh, neighborhoods, but de displacing residents that already lived in those communities, and in particular, displacing low-income residents. Now imagine that, right? You get CRA credit for displacing low-income people from an area, and that seemed to be um, antithetical to the, the purposes of CRA. Um, so I confess, I haven't uh, looked in detail at this proposed rule, so I really don't know if there are measures embedded in this proposed rule that will mitigate against that, con that dynamic, uh, right? There needs to be, and if not, you know, we definitely will be commenting on that. But it's a, it's a very, very important question because, look, we're in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, we are in the, um, uh, this is the epitome of gentrification and displacement. Um, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but, you know, at one time this city was known as Chocolate City. Uh, it no longer is because of gentrification and displacement, and I guarantee you that the lenders who uh, invested in all of these developments that we're seeing in around DC in and around DC that resulted in massive displacement of low and moderate income people um, those lenders got CRA credit for that right because those areas where they were investing um, were at one time low income they no longer are so so this is a huge issue that we have to make sure we're mitigating against in this new proposal. And um, I, I think you've heard all three of us say that we had high hopes and expectations that this proposal would be very equity focused. Mm -hmm. And anything that we can do to strengthen that equity provision, those equity provisions, um, I think we all are gonna do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to add something to that? Um, well, I, I agree uh, with what Lisa says, uh, but I'd also observe that not every part of the country is the same as Washington, mm -hmm. right? There are some places like Washington and there are others where gentrification and displacement are very serious issues, and I agree that CRA should not be fostering it. I would also parenthetically observe that with or without CRA, those are loans and investments that the market is driving. Um, but clearly, CRA should, doesn't need to um, grant credit for them. Uh, but uh, so I would like to see this rule have some uh, differentiation between the places that are gentrifying and the many, many places that are begging for revitalization. I was uh, in Alabama yesterday in Montgomery and Selma, and I wouldn't be so glib as to say, you know, they, they pray for gentrification, but they really need reinvestment in those places. There's, a tr it, there's tremendous economic and distress, social distress, physical distress. And so, uh, you know, there are markers for the neighborhoods that are gentrifying or not. And it would be fairly easy to uh, use that data to differentiate. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Buzz. I mean, this drives home the point that there's so much detail and so much technical work that needs to go into writing an effective rule. Um, so let's go into some of those little details because we have some audience questions. I'm sure our audience is very knowledgeable in the weeds. Hopefully many people out there writing comment letters. So let's, let's take some of these um, piece by piece. So I will go with one about the proposal would remove many small banks from the intermediate small bank category, which means they will no longer be subject to a community development test. What do you think the impact will be? Do you think small banks not subject to a community development requirement will continue their community development activities without that requirement. Any? I, I think it's a short answer. I, I, I actually think small community-based banks won't significantly change their activities, you know, in either direction based on the rule. So 
um, in my experience, you know, community banks, small banks tend to be sort of more in touch with community needs, and so I don't anticipate that changing, but I could be wrong a year from now. So, okay, <laughs> let's see. We'll be wrong record. We'll see. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, another uh, more technical question, uh, maybe Buzz, this is for you. Are you at all concerned that increased Honda reporting and scrutiny will cause even more mortgage lending to be moved away from regulated institutions toward non-bank lenders? So I think banks make fundamental strategic decisions about whether they want to be in any line of business. Um, and that includes mortgage lending. I'm not sure that CRA scrutiny is going to determine that very big decision. If a bank says it wants to provide mortgages, then CRA, um, under this proposal, uh, examines whether they are doing so fairly and equitably, regardless of how uh, big a part of a bank's product mix uh, it might be. OK, everybody agree that that's about the right answer? Yep. So um, you know, this proposal is written for today's financial services landscape. And it's the first time that it's been revised in nearly 30 years. So I'm thinking now, this is a question here about sort of the financial services landscape of the future and how well this. So the question specifically is, how will this proposal incorporate the evaluation of the use of AI and potential digital redlining? And Lisa, I know you've done a lot of thinking at NAFA around artificial intelligence, digital redlining as well. Um, so that's the specific question, but I also kind of would like us to think a bit about the banking ecosystem of the future and how well this rule will, will be able to keep up with that. You mean when we're all banking in the metaverse? <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> with our Bitcoin. Yeah. Living on Mars. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, with our Bitcoins <laughs> or other digital currency. Yeah, the, so that is a, it's a great question, and I think as far as this CRA proposal is concerned, that is largely going to depend on what happens in the fair lending space and with the fair lending mm -hmm. examinations and how uh, well the regulators are able to keep up with what is happening in the fair lending and fair housing environment from a regulatory standpoint and in those, examination, uh, those examinations that happen because the way that you ensure CRA sort of keeps up uh, is, is that alignment between what happens in, on the fair lending side and how it impacts that CRA rating, right? And Buzz made a point uh, that I think is really important. Now, I am dating myself a little bit, but um, a couple of decades ago, <laughs> boy, that hurt to say that. <laughs> um, I was living in Toledo, Ohio. It's my hometown. It's a um, middle-sized city, right? Um, and. Um, when I was at the Toledo Fair Housing Center, we did a ton of work with our local banks. And it would pain me because every time a local bank was going through a CRA process, they literally, they told us, Buzz, right out, we are hoping to get a satisfactory. We're not trying to get an outstanding. We're not shooting for and outstanding, and I think you and Marla are exactly right that what we were aiming for was a CRA proposal that would compel mm -hmm. banks to want to see an outstanding. So if you were going to get an outstanding and the fair lending test isn't looking so good for you and you're going to get a satisfactory, is that going to be okay for you? Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that you know I think we need are going to have to play themselves out, and we'll, we'll see how it affects the ecosystem and landscape. But um, I, I think to answer your question more pointedly, it, it is a lot is going to hinge on what happens in those fair lending exams. Yeah. And I saw you got real yeah. excited about this well, question. Well, I, it's just interesting to me. Um, you know, up until a year from now, I worked directly in communities, so at the very, very micro level. And what I found interesting about the proposed rule is 
sort of how they are going to include non-branch activity mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the issue around banking deserts, I think what's really positive about the rule is that it will encourage banks to find a way to connect customers to these non-branch activities, whereas before it was kind of like enough to say, well, we have mobile banking, so we cover everywhere. I mean, technically, you could be anywhere in the world and use our banking services from the, you know, your phone. But I think this actually forces a connection between sort of the availability of services in a non-traditional way and actually making sure that there's an uptake of those services. Because for me, that's the disconnect that I've seen is that, you know, um, for so many reasons that could take up, you know, a whole other hour, that uptake isn't there. And so you know, this may be sort of what propels that forward. And so I th that part was very exciting to me personally. So I think the agencies have done a really great job of structuring this in a way that is elastic, that can accommodate changes in the system and changes within any given institution as its own strategies change. So I think that's really terrific. Um, this question that you raised, Lisa, about going for the gold or just mm -hmm. barely going uh, is, I think, critically important. Why would a bank want to have an outstanding CRA rating unless, well, just why would they, right? So I can think of three reasons. One is uh, to protect themselves against the possibility that they will get a downgrade uh, uh, for fair lending or other violations that would cause them to actually fail a CRA exam. So there's some protection that they want to have some cushion. A second is because it may be the culture of a, of a bank to be an outstanding organization, just a high performance organization. And many banks see themselves that way and they don't want to lower the bar really for any part of what they do. And the third reason is um, their relative position among their peers. So if everybody else is getting an outstanding, they don't want to be the one bank that isn't getting outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, but if everybody's getting a satisfactory and the world doesn't come to an end, mm -hmm. then maybe it's not that important to be, set, to be outstanding. And, and so I, I would love to have lots of encouragement for outstanding performance. And that really gets to some of the potential beauty of CRA in the way that it's a dialogue between the, the world at large, the communities, the stakeholders, the researchers, <laughs> and the financial institutions themselves, as well as with the regulators. So to the extent that, again, that sunshine is there and that we're all staying in the conversation, it can actually materially change the outcome and the effectiveness. Yeah, and it can. And I think for the, in terms of future implications, we'll have to see. I mean, we're going to be impacted if, if Facebook decides, or Meta, I'm sorry, decides, <laughs> hey, yeah, we do want to get involved in banking in a real way. Um, how is that going to change the landscape and impact you know, all of the players down the line? So those, those are things that we all, I think, need to look out for. Great. So that may be your last word. I'm not sure. I kind of want to it's ask, have, a, have the last little, not necessarily, you can come back and have one last word, but <laughs> using that kind of lens, you know, how optimistic are you CRA can become effective and more effective and relevant? And any other closing remarks you want to uh, make? And then, Lisa, you can come back for one last final word. So we'll go Buzz and then Marla. So I'm uh, very excited about this uh, whole process and proposal that the agencies have gone through. Uh, access to capital is just so fundamental to economic opportunity in our country. And, uh, you know, there's more to it than CRA, but CRA is an essential part of that. Uh, I, I think it's proven its value over the last, well, since, particularly since uh, in the, in 1995 when we had a a rule that really looked at performance rather than just process. Uh, and, as, uh, and I do believe that CRA has transformed community development. CRA is kind of the opposable thumb to every other government policy and lots of private uh, investment activities. And it is so fundamental. So I'm optimistic that this rule 
uh, can really help uh, make America a much stronger and prosperous and equitable uh, place of opportunity. So I will second that optimism. Um, you know, I, I also just think what a historic moment that we witnessed in the first panel. So I, I just think, um, you know, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity that we're living and I, I feel very, very optimistic about this. And, and one thing that I wanted to just end on because I don't think that we really touched on it in our comments, um, kind of the, the other side of the coin to the lack of a call out to racial and ethnic equity, I think, is that there is a lot of explicit call out to rural and, and native communities. And, and I would just be remiss in not saying, you know, bravo for that because I think that's just so important and, you know, for my membership in particular, a lot of our members are operating in, in rural and native communities. And so I thought, um, while it doesn't make up for it, I was just very, very pleased to see that. And so I think that impact will be, you know, potentially where we see the greatest, um, you know, imprint from this rule. Thank you for, for calling us back to the amazingness <laughs> sure. of yeah. this moment, in fact, mm -hmm. and the fact that we're all here today. And thank you for the opposable thumb yeah, analogy. Like that. That's brilliant. <laughs> and with that, Lisa. Well, uh, um, I, I will say something that we, I don't, we really haven't talked about on this panel, and that is the transparency mm -hmm. component. I, and I am hopeful that that transparency piece will translate to the public. In other words, I'm hopeful that the public will have access to these dashboards, at least in some fashion, that the banks will be having um, and the data so that we can do our work more effectively. Well, Urban Institute agrees with that for sure. So <laughs> thank you very much. This thank was a you. great conversation. The, 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 the wisdom and the sort of perspective that you all bring together collectively is really, really helpful. So we appreciate it. Thank Let's you. have a big hand. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> And thank you all for joining us.